Welcome to part one of the Tomato Heaven series webinar. We are so excited to be here as we approach the end of part one of the 38th annual Grow Together Conference. I'm Serena Lewin. I'm one of the workshops and education coordinators at Green Thumb, the division of the NYC Parks Department that works with community gardens across the city. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We have Andrea and Anna with us for live Spanish interpretation. Ariel is gonna put directions on how to join the Spanish interpretation channel in the chat. We will be recording this session tonight and we'll be spotlighting our speakers. So the recording will not include you in it, but feel free to turn your camera on and off um, as we go through the workshop. Please use the chat for all questions. We're keeping track of them and we'll ask them out loud during a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Arielle is joining us today to be our Q&A host and our tech support. And tonight's workshop facil facilitator and tomato enthusiast is Maureen O'Brien. Maureen is the Brooklyn Botanic Garden Community Field Manager. She's also a master composter, a community gardener, and a greening activist. She holds a certificate in horticulture from the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Maureen enjoys growing food, flowers, and herbs with her composting husband and family at a farmette in Pennsylvania and at 615 Green Community Garden in South Park Slope, Brooklyn. I'm going to pass the mic to Maureen and we're going to get started. Thanks for being here. Hi, Serena. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. It's so great to be here um, with everybody and so nice to see so many faces. Wow, it's amazing. I know that we're not like in the same room together, but it feels a little bit like we like we might be uh, soon. So um, uh, just to get started, wanted to say that I really, 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 really love growing tomatoes. And I want to thank uh, my mom and dad, Rose and Lou, and my grandparents for getting me started in gardening. Um, it's really been a blessing throughout my life. Um, so I am going to switch my view to be gallery view now and scroll through a little bit. So if you feel inclined to uh, put your video on, just wondering like how many people, I saw a couple people listed where they were from, but like how many people here are from Manhattan today? So raise your hand and give a little shout out if you're from Manhattan. Okay, I see some people from Manhattan. How about Queens? Who here is from Queens? Okay. All right. I see some Queens people gesturing. How about Staten Island? Do we have any gardeners here from Staten Island today? Come on, Staten Island. There must be some people here. Okay. I see some hands from Staten Island. Okay. Uh, how about Brooklyn? Is Brooklyn here? Okay. All right. I see a lot of Brooklyn people. <laughs> It doesn't matter if you're not from Brooklyn, you know, it's still okay. And how about people from out of town? Anybody calling in from uh, uh, the UK or the Congo or Philadelphia? Okay. All right, great. Well, everybody, oh, Westchester County, Kingsbridge, the Bronx. Okay, everybody, welcome. Um, uh, it's great to have you here. And uh, thanks for all coming to this uh, Zoom room. So um, Tomato Heaven Part 1, starting from seed, we're going to dive into that. Um, but I wanted to mention a couple of things that are super, I think that are super groovy about uh, tomatoes is that they're super healthy. So in addition to being delicious, they have a lot of health benefits. They're high in vitamin A, vitamin C, and antioxidants. Um, and antioxidants, all that stuff reduces harmful radicals, which kind of protects our health. They also contain lycopene, and lycopene can help prevent heart disease, arterial sclerosis, breast cancer, and prostate cancers. Uh, it also protects our cell membranes, which is really important when like to toxins are trying to get through. Uh, it helps keep them strong. Um, they protect against, it's believed that they protect against premature aging. And they're super beautiful, low calorie, and delicious. Del delicious. Um, so uh, I just wanted to encourage people to, you know, just uh, think to yourself or jot down why is growing tomatoes from seed important to you? Do you want to grow heirloom variety that maybe you can't buy plants from in a store? Do you want to preserve seeds from a family member? Do you want to save money by starting from seed rather than buying plants? Just, just you know, think for a couple minutes about that 
And then if you feel inclined, um, uh, type your reason in the chat. Okay, so I see um, more nutrients, better taste, no, pestify, no, no pesticides, um, to learn how to grow my own food, to embrace seasonal bounty. Um, let's see, any other reasons? Also to maybe grow ones that are kind of unusual, to experiment with different varieties. And I see there's a couple questions in there too. So we are going to get to questions at the end of this, um, this section to share with people to be self sufficient, all amazing reasons to start um, your own tomatoes from seeds, different flavors, different types, um, maybe to preserve an heirloom or other reason. So thank you so much for for sharing sharing that. Um, so, you know, We've started thinking about what kind of tomatoes that you want to, you might want to grow. I wanted to talk about the different kinds of tomatoes. So even just kind of thinking what you might, why you might want to, maybe like what's the right match for you. So tomatoes kind of come in a, in a few different uh, basic types. Um, so there are cherry tomatoes, cherry or grape or pear tomatoes that are kind of small. They're usually pretty intensely flavored and sweet, and they tend to start ripening a little bit earlier than other tomatoes. Uh, the next kind are paste tomatoes. So these are kind of oval. They're usually kind of thicker walled and a little bit kind of meatier. They're good to use in sauces and stews. And uh, it is possible with the plum tomatoes sometimes to get determinate seeds, which means they ripen all at the same time. Then here, this like Mara globe, this is called a slicing tomato. So these are tomatoes that are basically round shaped. They're almost the size of a piece of bread. So they're kind of good for making sandwiches or uh, caprese salad with mozzarella, you know, kind of a good all around type. Then this, which this is a, a seed packet from Paul Robeson tomatoes. These are beefsteak tomatoes. So these are the ones that are really like, really hunky. They're kind of like oblong, uh, really beefy, kind of like whiny tasting almost. And um, they take longer to grow, uh, a longer season. Um, they're also very popular and they come in a lot of different kind of heirlooms. Uh, let's see. So. Thinking about how you might use them could also kind of inform what types to grow. Uh, do you want them to grow all at once or over a long season? Do you want to sell them at a market? Do you want the prettiest ones, the most delicious ones? Again, the cherry tomatoes kind of start producing uh, soonest, so it's nice to have some tomatoes early in the season. And then the big honkin' um, uh, beefsteak tomatoes take a longer season. Um, let's see what else. So I usually, oh, and also cherry tomatoes too, they kind of take longer to pink, pick. So even though they're fun and early, sometimes the harvest time is, you know, you want to take that into consideration. So I personally like to plant mostly big, big beef steaks. I like Cherokee purple and, uh, Paul Robeson. Uh, I usually plant a few, plum tomatoes because I like to have a little bit of tomatoes in the wintertime. So I like to can some things. And last year I tried a determinant variety called Supremo that's available from uh, botanical interest seeds. And they actually worked really good. They ripened all at the same time. So I could do a big canning project all at once. Um, then I also like to grow some cherry tomatoes or grape tomatoes, just a couple of them because they do take a long time to pick. But I like uh, having those in my community garden plot at 615 Green. And then kids who are visiting can pick them and um, also my grandchildren can pick them. So uh, that's like lots of fun and a way to get kids into gardening. Uh, so just think for a minute or two for yourself, like with why you might want to grow tomatoes and then what's maybe a good match for how you want to use them and you might want to give them away like for mutual aid uh so maybe over a long season is good but just you know think to yourself 
what might be a good match for the type of tomato. Um, uh, you can write it in the chat if you want, but you don't need to. Um, so I wanted to mention that something that's like very special about tomatoes is that they're originally from Central and South America, much closer to the equator than New York City. So they need full sun and warm soil. So they need full sun and warm soil. Tomatoes really like full sun and warm soil. So the growing season in New York City is way, way too short to give them the full sun and the warm soil that they need. So it's essential that we start tomato plants inside. So this takes some care and a little attention, yet it, I think it's easy to uh, master. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, share my screen and we will dive into uh, cherry tomato heaven. Uh, can everybody see? Can everybody see that? Let's see. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. Sounds like we can see it. Okay. So, um, here we have some different heirloom tom tomato varieties. So up in the, um, upper left, you can see we've got uh, green doctor's cherry tomatoes in the middle top is striped Roma paste tomatoes, which are gorgeous tomatoes. I mean, they're really good for salads and everything too. Uh, then we have uh, the blueberry clocomus, which is kind of a medium sized tomato. It's almost black looking. Then there's a gold metal beef stick on the bottom right hand side, which is a delicious tomato, like kind of a uh, really good tomato taste. In the middle is that crazy looking tie dyed um, Berkeley slicing tomato. I think that's really beautiful. And then on the uh, bottom left is Grandfather Ashlock. That's another beefsteak uh, tomato, you know, really nice and uh, uh, robust. Whoops. Okay. Okay, so to get started, um, I would suggest gather up all your seed starting supplies, um, some sterile soilless medium. Um, that's very important. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Then some clean containers. They could be containers that you've reused from a previous year or a milk carton or even eggshells can work. So they should be clean though. So uh, wash them. If they're not new, wash them with hot soapy water or bleach water um, before you reuse them. Uh, then for seed starting, we'll also need some water, of course, seeds plant tags or like tongue depressors to use as uh, plant tags, a pencil and a drip tray. So it is definitely necessary to start warm season crops like tomatoes and eggplant and peppers uh, inside since they need a really long season and the season in New York is too short, short to start them outside in the regular soil. Okay, so the sterile soilless mix. It's really important to use this instead of regular garden soil um, to avoid a disease that's called damping off. So that's caused by like a naturally occurring uh, bacteria and fungi that's in uh, the soil. So if you've ever had a, a you know a, a tomato plant or any kind of plant that's kind of like you're starting inside, it's like growing up, it's like really looks great, and then you come out one morning and it's like oh like all slumped over like this right at the soil line. Uh, you can see that sometimes it gets like a little thin and that's because the fungus is kind of interacting with the plant and uh, you know it just you know it's kind of done then once the stem's gone it's done so by using a soilless mix that helps avoid that problem and also by watering from the bottom that we're going to talk about um, a little bit you can also make your own mix by uh, using one part coir or peat one part sand and one part sifted compost. So coir is more sustainable, sustainable than peat. Peat is a, a limited resource, even though there's lots of it in uh, Canada, but it's, uh, it's good that we preserve that. And um, coir is made from uh, coconut. It's a byproduct of the coconut uh, industry, the coconut husks. Uh, let's see, this is not advancing. Okay. 
moisten. So it's very important to moisten the soilless mix. Uh, just add water little by little and mix it together with a, a trowel or a spoon until it feels like a wrung out sponge. So not all drippy, not super dry, um, just, just right. Um, so here's a little uh, do-it-yourself um, uh, watering can, thanks to uh, Lillian Reyes for this idea. So I drilled uh, little holes into a milk bottle cap to make a fine rose for watering or for moistening in the soil. So this actually works really good and it's a way to recycle things and um, also saves money. So again, moisten so that your soil feels like a wrung out sponge. So if you're if you're squeezing your hand, maybe there's like little tears kind of welling up between your fingers, but no drips. So the soil shouldn't be too wet. If it is too wet, it's a good idea to add a little bit more dry soil. So then fill your container. Uh, this is a container that is clearly one that I reused and I washed it out with uh, vinegar water. Uh, gently add the soil and then tap it on the sides to kind of um, let the soil settle down. So don't like compress it or squish it down because those little rootlets are going to need like room to grow in that little soil cell. Then make some labels. So label the kind of seeds that you're going to um, sow before you actually sow them because they kind of look all the same once they're once they're in the pot. So these are um, some seeds that I started for this class back in um, December. I started some, you know, cherries, some of the slicers, some of the beefsteak, and um, uh, Roma. So plant your seeds. I recommend putting two seeds in the middle of each cell uh, and then label them. So they don't, it's, it's ideal if they're in the center. If they don't, you know, fall right in the center, you can always reposition them with a pencil or kind of don't sweat it, but it's nice to know, um, you know, kind of where they are and see them come up all nice and even. Uh, right after this, add a little bit of dry soil. So lightly sprinkle some of the dry, well, actually soilless medium on top of there. Use the um, seed packets as a guide. So, um, for example, this cherry seed uh, packet on the back, it says to plant them an eighth of an inch deep. So just sprinkle very lightly on top of that. For the rest of the kind, the, the paste and the uh, beef steak, that says a quarter of an inch. So just follow the directions on the packet. Um, but if you have seeds that you're saving that a relative or friend uh, gave you, I would say a quarter of an inch is a pretty good rule of thumb for how much dry soil. Uh, to put on the top. Uh, next is watering uh, your newly planted uh, uh, little little packet there. So this is going to be the only time that we water from the top uh, while the plants are growing inside. So place um, place a large container or drip tray under your plant area and then gently water it from the top with a watering can, one that you make or one that maybe you have. So it should be a fine, fine watering spray there. Uh, be gentle so that you don't dislodge the seeds. We want the so seeds to get moist, but not to be like sloshing around inside the seed containers. Uh, and the water is very important because water is a catalyst that like wakes the cell up so that it can start growing. Next, so next, after your uh, your newly planted seeds are moistened, move them into uh, a warm location. So this might be a windowsill. Uh, this is a sunny windowsill, and um, this is a spot where the seeds can germinate. That's the next thing that's going to happen. Um, so tomato seeds themselves do not need sun to germinate like some plants do, uh, but they can benefit from the warmth. So this this uh, place would be you know great because it's a sunny windowsill and if the soil is warm then they'll germinate a little bit faster. Uh, next, so keep the soil well watered. Um, I would say every two or three days water your little uh, transplant or your little seed packet by putting it in a tray of water. Um, 
and always water from the from the bottom. So just fill the tray up with water, put your little plants in and allow the moisture to wick up into the seedlings. So after about five or 10 minutes, the water will be wicked up from the bottom and you can take the, uh, the little um, cell tray out, uh, let it dry off and then put it back to the original uh, position. So I just wanna emphasize that point saying always water from the bottom and I know people are muted, but I just want to say, like, repeat after me, always water from the bottom. Always water from the bottom. Always water from the bottom. And where should you water from? The bottom. Okay, that's very important to avoid that damping off disease and to keep uh, tomatoes healthy. So they should, again, before they uh, germinate, they should be moist. They shouldn't be sh sopping or too uh, glisteny, but they need to be, the soil should be cool and moist. So then every two weeks, use a double diluted fish emulsion or compost tea in the water to fertilize the uh, seeds. You know, they'll probably start sprouting after a while, but this is a good um, thing to give them the nutrition because we've started them in soilless uh, in a soilless medium so they don't really have nutrition from anywhere else. And remember, always do that with watering from the bottom. So, you know, I mentioned before that tomatoes are from Central and South America, so they really, really want warm soil. They love heat, especially bottom heat, and they do need it to germinate. So if you're starting a lot of tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, I highly recommend a heat mat. It really does give them a jump start, and then you get you know pretty big, robust plants. Um, other possibilities would be if you have like a uh, the back of your refrigerator, maybe put some trays up there, or if there's a shelf nearby there, so that the air temperature is a little bit warmer, then that will warm the soil. You definitely don't want to put them on a radiator. That's way too hot, and that'll kill the plants. And it could be near a, a window as long as the window isn't too cold. So I would say uh, if the tomato plants are in a place that, you know, has um, not in a draft, uh, not necessarily in the sun, but the soil should be warm so that they can germinate. Wow, here we've got germination. So we see some little sprouts. So once you get these sprouts, it's very important to put your seedlings, now little baby seedlings, in a sunny, sunny location. So put them in the sun and then rotate them every day so that they um, you know, don't start like growing off in one direction, this direction, this direction. Um, and you can start to gently stroke them every day so that they get, um, they develop strong stems. And of course, if you have grow lights, the grow lights can be, you know, like three inches from the top of that. But with these, uh, I don't have any grow lights, so we're just doing it with sunshine. Um, so let's see. So we're going to just take a little pause right here. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. And let's have, let's see, let's have about... About, I think we have about five minutes for questions about things that we went over so far. Hey, um, someone was asking if um, tomatoes have the same nutrition when they're cooked uh, versus when they're raw. I'm curious about that too. That's a great question. I wish I knew the answer to that. So I'm guessing they probably have more nutrition when they're raw, but actually I don't know. Does anyone else in the room know the answer to that question? Are there any nutritionists here? <laughs> oh, yes to more nutrition raw, someone's saying. Thank you, okay. Thanks. That's good to know. Um, then uh, are the Robeson varieties hard to grow? Uh, you know what? I've been asked that before, and I haven't found the Robeson varieties hard to grow, but because other people have told me that they thought they were hard to grow, maybe, maybe they are. I haven't, I haven't had uh, issues with that, though. I would say the one beefsteak that I have had uh, issues with is, um, is black crim. Mm -hmm. It just seems like every time I try to start black crim, they somehow get like some kind of, you know, 
I don't know. They just, they just never seem to be healthy and eventually they die. So. Okay. Do you have time for one more? Yeah, I think, I think we have, yeah, we have, to, we have time for, we have time for a couple more. Okay. Um, someone was asking how long before the last frost do you usually plant seeds? I feel like that's coming up. Yes. So um, that's a great question. And, you know, a lot of times it'll say on the seed packet, um, you know, this one for the Mariglobe, it says uh, plant indoors six to eight weeks before danger of frost has passed. Um, so I usually like to start tomatoes, you know, at least eight weeks before uh, the last frost, which um, is like about April 15th. But I don't plant tomatoes out right after the, the last frost because they really, really, really like warm soil. So I would say, you know, you can do it earlier. I typically plant um, tomatoes out into the garden, like on Memorial Day weekend. So you can really do it like May 15th ish, maybe even Mother's Day weekend. Um, but I feel like it's, um, sometimes the tomatoes can get stunted then if it gets just a little cold because like the last frost date like you could put something out and they won't like die but because tomatoes really like the heat i recommend waiting for peppers eggplant como a los tomates les gusta tomatoes. el caliente entonces tenemos que esperar um i'm sorry we're having an issue with spanish interpretation you can continue <laughs> Other questions? I think we have time for maybe two more questions if there are some. Okay. Um, someone was asking if, uh, if their backyard gets four to five hours uh, of sunlight uh, per day in the summer, is that um, adequate for tomato plants? That is a fantastic question. Um, so four to six hours, I would say like, six ish, you know, six ish is really kind of the minimum for tomatoes, like six to eight or like eight to 12, like really the more, the better, um, is good for tomatoes. I, I really do also like if, the, if you have like six hours of full sun and it's really good full sun, I would suggest trying a container type tomato. So one, especially for containers and a smallish tomato like cherry tomatoes actually one thing that's not really a tomato but tomatillos if you like tomatillos they can um they can kind of deal with like six hours of sun and have a good a good harvest but for uh for tomatoes they really really do like sun so i strongly advise your sunniest spot and if six hours is is what you got i would try like a small variety but for the big ones i would just say um you know a place that has more eight hours of sun is going to be better and maybe even think like if you're in a community garden and some plots are super sunny and some plots aren't maybe collaborate with someone so that you grow tomatoes together in the sunniest plot and then grow you know greens or things that can take some um uh, some shade in another area because I would say with tomatoes like they want what they want and if you try growing if I, I believe me I've made every tomato mistake ever known to man I have tried planting them in shade I tried planting them in awful soil I didn't give them enough compost and you know it was hopeful but they didn't do well so you know uh, giving them good nutrition and good sun and warm soil they'll thrive And lastly, this will be easy because I think you were just talking about tomatillos. Um, would you say that ground cherries require the same conditions as well as tomatoes and tomatillos? I think that ground cherries can do like kind of like with tomatillos. I actually haven't grown ground cherries before. Um, I really love them, um, but uh, I haven't I haven't grown them. But I think that they might take they can take a little bit of shade like um, tomatillos can, but I don't know. Does anyone else here, anyone here in the room today have grown um, ground cherries and know how much sun they need? Wait, Nina, I, th I thought I saw Nina here. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Nina, Nina Brown, my colleague at BBG says they're a lot like tomatillos. So, so, and I grew tomatillos for the last couple of years in a place that I thought there wasn't enough sun for tomatoes and they did really well. And we um, used them for our mutual aid efforts. Um, I see someone has four hours of sun on their balcony. I would say that's not enough to grow tomatoes. So I think, you know, choosing something else that will do well is probably better. So I think I would like to um, go back to sharing my screen for just a little bit, and then we're going to come back and have some additional questions a bit later. Sound good? Okay, let's see. Okay, so Serena, can you see my shared screen? I can. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, seedling care. So just imagine your little tomato seeds, they've sprouted, they're growing. Um, uh, move them again, move them into the sunniest location and rotate them every day so that they don't like start leaning in one direction if you're not using um, the, you know, grow lights. Keep fertilizing them once every two weeks with a double diluted fertilizer and make sure uh, to let them dry out in between waterings. So they shouldn't look like super hot and dry if they're ever wilting, water them right away, but it's good to let them dry out a little bit. Um, and then you can start to kind of pet them or stroke them a little bit, just like very lightly on the top. And that helps them um, get strong stems um, because they don't have any wind resistance because they're, you know, inside. Um, you can see here uh, that there's one tiny little weed on this like little first thing. So I kind of have the tomato seeds were, you know, spaced pretty evenly in the center, but there is one little kind of weedy thing right there on the side. I don't know how that got in there. And then in the back one, you can see there's still like a little seed coat there. Um, Oh, and then I said, uh, you know, singing is optional, uh, but I did see someone here today who has told me that their plants always grow better because of singing to them. So, um, and I've tried that and I think it, it works. Let's see, I'm having a little trouble advancing. Okay, here we go. Uh, so the seedling care, you know, keep doing the same thing, uh, watering from the bottom. Um, look for sets of true leaves. So when the plant has like two or three sets of true leaves, it's a good time to step it up. Um, so here is a, a cell pack of seedlings. The ones on the right have just germinated. So you can see it just has the cotyledons, those kind of smooth leaves that have just uh, emerged. And even the little seed cap is still, seed coat is still attached to them. So the ones on the right hand side, they're not even close to being ready to step up. But the ones on the left hand side, which are Cherokee purple tomatoes, those have uh, two or three sets of true leaves, and so they're ready to step up into bigger containers. So for stepping up, um, get together those same kind of um, supplies that you had in the very beginning when you planted seeds, and add about an inch or two of uh, moist potting soil to the bottom of a container. Uh, I usually reuse, um, you know, clean three to four inch um, pots that I've saved from a previous year. I select the healthiest, like more ro most robust looking seedlings with two or three sets of leaves. And I usually use like a fork or knife to kind of pry them out of the bottom of the um, cell pack. Um, so make sure to support the stem when you're putting it into the new container. So hold the stem because you can kind of grow new roots and grow some new leaves, but if the stem gets damaged, then um, you'll probably have to start with a new seedling. So um, just while holding um, the seedling in, in place, uh, add soil front on the sides and then tap it 
to kind of tamp it down a little bit and you can lightly press it but don't press it in too hard because the roots are really going to need space to kind of grow and make nice big robust plants um, fill the soil uh, back fill it up there till it's about an inch or a half an inch from the top of the pot and then add a plant tag um, you know this is important because uh, especially if you want to save seeds for later on is important or if you want to um, uh, you know group all your cherry tomatoes in the same place or all your plum tomatoes in the same place uh, it's good to keep track of what is where and all the tomato varieties pretty much look the same like I would say cherry tomatoes the leaves look a little bit different but once you get it in the pot and get a whole bunch of pots together it's hard to tell what's what at least for me it is um, then after you you step up uh, the little seedling it's very important to water it so water it from I know everyone is saying the bottom to themselves uh, water it from the bottom and let that water just wick up into uh, the newly potted plant then take it out of the container and put it back to its original spot which should be your sunniest location so here it is here's our little plant um, in with a nice bright Sun coming in um, continue to uh, stroke it every day water it every couple days when it dries out and then rotate it every day to make sure that it's kind of growing up straight um, and uh, you know it'll start doing pretty good now here I love this I love this photo because this is this just shows a really big difference between a plant on the left which was stepped up three weeks before the plant on the right so these were plants that I started from seed on exactly the same day but because there was more so, more space uh, for the roots to grow the plant could really kind of take off and make like a very robust um, seedling and I think that is I'm going to stop sharing um, so that that I do I do think that um, stepping up is a very very important for uh, plants so that by the time that you're planting out into the garden you have like a really hefty robust plant that can kind of um, survive and thrive uh, out there rather than one that's like you know just little and only a couple inches high then it will need to be babied um, for a little bit so um, we can we can, we have some time for questions and also um, uh, Serena is going to put in the chat um, a tip some tip sheets for this class which are kind of like a review of the seed starting steps and also some aftercare steps um, uh, I'm going to teach another class for the green thumb grow together which is tomato heaven part two which is called uh, uh, step up harden off and plant out um, but we, we do have about like 15 minutes for questions so if there's questions about what to do for any of the steps that we've gone over before I'd be happy to try to answer them or find someone in the room today who can help answer um, and if there's any other kind of troubleshooting general uh, tomato questions or specific ones, I'm happy to give that a shot too. And I want to thank everybody for your attention. And it's great to see so many people. Wow, 53 people here. That's really exciting. And thanks, Green Thumb, for having this great, uh, great program. Oh, and uh, yeah, and I, I, I see right now, since I'm on Gallery View, I see it's some of the people who like to sing to their plants. So. Thanks for that tip. That's helping me get a lot more tomatoes. So what questions do you have? Um, okay, I collected a bunch that are related to care and maintenance. Um, so I'm just going to go down the list. Um, how often do you feed your plants after transplanting? That's it maybe for later. So um, after transplanting, so I would say once they're stepped up, uh, continue to feed them, you know, every two weeks with uh, double diluted fish emulsion or compost tea until you plant them outside. And when you plant them outside or when they're planted outside, 
I um, and we'll talk about this in the next class but when they're uh, planted outside I usually dig a really big hole a deep hole and plant them deep and I always put a shovel full of compost in the hole and then mid-season I like to side dress them with compost at least twice during the season so that they'll get a lot of nutrition and of course plant them in soil that's that's you know good good healthy garden soil to begin with and you can also use um, uh, compost tea or fish emulsion to fertilize them with but it's actually I think that once they're planted out in the garden compost is the best because if you give tomato plants too much fertilizer then they'll grow they'll, they'll that'll like uh, stimulate uh, leaf growth and you want to have um, you want to have leaf growth but not too much you know it's important to have good fruit sets so if there's too much fertilizer it tends to like for kind of any plant give too much lush growth and then it can be um, susceptible to pests and it just kind of like too much nitrogen goes into leaf growth not fruit set does that help answer the question i think so and just to clarify, when you're stepping up, are you using potting mix or also like a mix of um, potting mix and compost or regular garden soil? Right. So I would I would recommend to use the soilless uh, medium, either one that you make your own with compost, sand and coir or peat or one that's a pre-mixed thing, because the plants are still going to be inside once you step them up. Uh, they still might have, you know, depending on when you're going to plant them out, like three weeks to, you know, five weeks still inside while you're growing them into like big hunky plants to set them outside. Once they're outside, it's a little different because outside there's all the wind and the air is going around and all that stuff. So it isn't going to be a problem with like damping off or watering your plants at the soil level. Um, so you don't really have to worry about damping off once they're outside. Cool. Um, there's a few questions kind of related, I think, to like urban gardening. Um, if there are varieties better suited for indoors and if um, tomatoes can stay in containers. Um, yes, other than I would say and what I see what varieties are better for indoor only gardens, you know, I don't really, I, I've heard, I know of people who are, have grown tomatoes successfully, like in a window box, um, but I don't, I don't really, I, I haven't tried growing them inside. You know, I think they're really uh, best suited for outside because they really need warm soil and lots and lots of sun and even kind of you know, so I don't know if anyone else can speak to growing um, tomatoes indoors, but I think they're, I think of them as really like an outdoor plant. I do highly recommend uh, tomatoes that are made specifically for containers, like um, Renee's Garden Seeds has a couple variety of plum tomatoes that are called like tomato plum tomatoes. Anything that's like a patio tomato, uh, container variety tomato they do really well in containers just make sure that your container is big enough so that there's if it's a I would say they kind of need about like two to three um, square feet per tomato so don't crowd your tomatoes they really they're really heavy feeders and they need um, they need you know, good soil and compost and plenty of room to, to spread out. Because if you have like, say if you have like uh, um, a three foot container, like a, a whiskey barrel kind of container, like a half, you know, barrel container. If you tried to plant like six tomato plants in there, you know, none of them are going to do good. But if you plant like one and then maybe do some companion planting around it, you're really going to get like very good tomatoes and a good healthy plant. Um, and even some container varieties, I would say too, you know, I kind of think of raised beds as big containers. So, um, you know, if the soil depth is only like, you know, eight to 12 inches, uh, you know, you can could consider a container, container type tomato. Uh, 
let's see. I saw something about Epsom salts in there too. A yeah, five gallon sure. bucket. A five gallon bucket. Yeah, like a like a drywall compound bucket. That's a that's a great size for one tomato. Um, someone asked if you put uh, a bit of Epsom salt when transplanting. Uh, I don't personally do that, but um, I do know people who put some Epsom salts in, and that is supposed to help, I think, with with uh, fruit set. I usually put in some crushed eggs. I put like a big deep hole, a shovel of compost, some crushed eggshells uh, for calcium or a Tums tablet, like Tums, the, if you have like an upset stomach, it has calcium in it and a penny and for copper and a rusty nail. <laughs> I've never heard that. But that's what I've just learned from other people. Mom and dad, my friend Alice, you know, they, they do that. And the, the tomatoes seem to do pretty good. Um, Fools of the trade. Yeah. <laughs> and there are, it's true. I see a uh, higher phosphorus tomato fertilizer, uh, plastic and uh, black mulch. So the phosphorus, so specific tomato fertilizers, they 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 might be fine i just i haven't personally used them and you know phosphorus is is really important um for good tomato health but i've just i use i pretty much use compost as my go-to uh and it means i don't have to buy anything i have heard that the red uh the red mulch and black mulch are um uh, are helpful as far as keeping the soil warm. And I, I really don't know why the red mulch works. You know, you think tomatoes are red and red mulch. I, I don't really know about that. They could be fine. I feel like I do kind of top dress with um, with compost. So I do sound like a broken record here, compost, compost, po compost. But also I try to minimize the use of plastic. So, um, you know, a lot of times I'll put uh, a layer like a double layer of newspaper on either side of the tomato plant and then cover that up with uh, compost as well so that the weeds won't come through. Uh, other questions? Um, maybe, yeah, maybe this is one of the last few. Um, how, how do you stop um, tomatoes from splitting on the vine before um, they're ripe? That's a great, that's a great question. And I see something about be careful digging around if I have rusty nails in the soil. Yes, I will be careful. Actually, the holes I dig are pretty, pretty deep and the nails are really small. But thank you for your concern. <laughs> I, I totally, yeah, I need to stay up on my tetanus shots. Um, can you can you say that question again, Ariel? Um, how to stop tomatoes from splitting on the vine before right. you how harvest. To stop splitting? That is a great question, especially like last year too, we had periods where there was like so much rain all at once and um, there was a lot of splitting happening. So because of splitting and also sometimes because of like squirrels and other critters. So sometimes I will, I've been tending to harvest tomatoes when maybe they have just a little blush on them, especially the big beefsteak ones. They're like a little bit of blush on them, but they're not totally ripe. And I'll harvest them and let them ripen inside. And if we're gonna have a lot of rain, and if I have some large beefsteaks, I will cut them green and bring them inside so that they won't split because you really can't kind of stop the rain. Um, uh, but, you know, getting too much rain at once and tomatoes do like they like kind of like an even regular amount of water. So, uh, you know, I do water tomato plants regularly, but if we're getting a lot of rain, then, you know, I just they should get like about an inch a week. Great. Um, let's see. Um, Oh, this is maybe related to some indoor growing too. If you have any suggestions for grow lights um, in order to supplement sun time. Um, I, I know that those, like at BBG, we have those grow light setups um, that are especially for tomatoes, but I don't really personally have very much experience with those. So if someone, if anyone here has had experience with those and has a recommendation, maybe you could type that into the, um, into the chat. I actually did use um, 
at one point I thought I would try something. And so I used like fish aquarium lights, which are just two small tubes. And I kind of set it up on some change so that it would work because basically I'm too cheap to buy like the big setup. Um, and I do have a couple of windows uh, now that are okay. Um, but I think that that's as long as they're fluorescent. Let's see if, um, so I see, uh, and actually, you know what, if I'm going to put my uh, email address in the chat. So as far as um, those grow lights, so whoever was interested in that question, if you can email that question to me at BBG, I'll find out from our um, education uh, greenhouse staff what they recommend, because I know that the children's garden and a bunch of other places they grow their transplants inside um, and they use grow lights so I'd be happy to find that out um, thank you let's see I so so when do you transfer your tomatoes outside so um, that we're gonna cover in the next workshop but I usually do it uh, the weekend of Memorial Day or that during that week because then the soil temperatures usually at least 65 and hopefully more around 70 and tomatoes really really like warm soil um, especially since they're urgently from uh, central and south america um, so i tend to transplant them then you know some sometimes i've transplanted them like mother's day or the week of may 15th and you know sometimes we'll have a kind of cold wet spring so if the tomatoes go out earlier um that can be okay but sometimes they just don't like it because it's too cool and they get like a little bit purplish colored and a little like shriveled looking and to me it seems like they never bounce back so over the years i've just decided to be kind of patient plant them later they seem to always catch up so they seem to like once once the weather is hot enough they just totally take off um let's see there were some questions about like pest control about uh controlling spider mites and moldy mildew spider mites okay i'm gonna write that down i saw a question about um the deep planting and actually i really do recommend like very deep planting for tomatoes so oh oh i totally forgot here's the little tomato plant right here that i brought I brought this little friend. This is uh, was was uh, stepped up a month ago. It's a chocolate cherry. So actually, for a tomato plant like this, I mean, I would never plant this outside because it's still winter time. But what I like to do is I pinch off all the leaves except for the very top leaves and plant the entire stem. So you can dig like a deep hole and plant it down or I tend to dig a trench. Like I'll dig a trench that's about 12 inches long and then kind of plant the tomatoes sideways in that so it has you know plenty of soil on top of it and then it grows tons of roots. So with tomato plants, if you plant them deep, they just sprout roots along the whole stem and you'll have like a really hardy tomato plant that's getting all the nutrition it possibly can um, uh, out of there. So the I'm thinking that the that the spider mites and the um, the other stuff are indoor problems, and I have heard that I think it's watering with cinnamon water can help with spider mites. But I, I actually I just don't know because I haven't had problems with those. Do other people have um, uh, tips for how to deal with spider mites or mildew? Mildew, I would say having stuff far apart and having good air circulation if you're having problem with air with mildew maybe spread the plants further apart or put like a fan on them um, to try to get better air circulation but uh spider mites i don't i don't know nina do you have any tips for spider mites oh she can't unmute. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Or maybe type in the chat. Type in the chat if you have a spider mite. If you have a spider mite. Um, 
And then also aphids, somebody who had a, a issue with aphids and got ladybugs. Yeah, aphids too. I would say I I actually like try to look at my tomatoes like every day to see if there's any any problems, uh, especially like the tomato hornworm because every once in a while I'll see like something's been at my tomatoes and then I just want to find out what that is and then I'll see a tomato hornworm. And my favorite thing, which actually I have pictures of in this next this next class is if I, so I'll hand pick the tomato hornworm and if it's covered with these little cottony white things, that means that those are the eggs from the parasitic wasp. And what happens is that they'll hatch and they'll eat the tomato hornworm. So I just kind of put the tomato hornworm somewhere else. I don't put it in a bucket of soapy water because I don't want to kill those eggs that are going to eat the hornworm. But um, so anyway, and then, you know, they're not going to eat my tomatoes any anymore. Um, right, and insecticidal soap, right, insecticidal soap is good for, um, for spider mites, and you can make your own with Dr. Bronner's, little Dr. Bronner's, a little water, I can't remember, I think there's one other ingredient, but there's recipes online uh, for that. Thank you so much, Maureen and Ariel and the whole Green Thumb staff that's helping out, and our interpreters, Andrea and Anna. I'm going to stop the recording.